G'day. Did you know that in 1991, the rap group Salt and Pepper recorded the hit single, Let's Talk About Sex? And that's what we're going to do today. Talk about sex. The words of their chorus in that particular song was, let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about the good things and the bad things that may be. It was pretty racy stuff to discuss in the public forum of, public, of music in those days, but uh, they weren't the first to do it. However, you'll find that they lacked a bit of authority. They were kids. Appealing to medical science is something that only covers the physical on the how-to, but not on the why or the moral attachments to modern sexuality. So we need to look elsewhere. Did you know that the Bible is just full of sex? All kinds of sex. Yes, it's true. Everything from erotica to illicit entanglements all the way down to rape and torture. There is a, a proper framework, however, in which we can view this vast subject. And the purpose of what I want to do today is to help us line out the appropriate categories in that framework. Before we begin, uh, we need to establish a few ground rules and understand that, from where I stand, the scriptures of the Old and New Testament speak for themselves. In fact, I stand on the idea that scripture is inerrant and infallible in our faith and our practice of it. Scripture is inspired, and so we, we don't throw out parts because they're older or because we don't like them or they don't fit into our culture. Scripture is uniform in all that it teaches. It's God's word and his counsel to say he doesn't, God doesn't lie. He doesn't get it wrong or mixed up. And when we're looking at supposed variances of Scripture, we should engage in both biblical and systematic theology to get the overall broad view as well as to see the developmental aspect of it through historical theology. So if we can agree on that, let's continue. I want to talk first of all the fact that sex is a gift. It's a wondrous thing given to humankind by our Creator God who realized that human fulfillment was not happening in the Garden of Eden for Adam. And so he created a partner for him, which we know to be Eve. Not long after that, they had some kids, which you can read about in Genesis 4, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. The Bible, however, is very silent on how the two of them knew what to do to create babies. But suffice it to say that they figured it out and got on with it. Uh, watching the animal kingdom multiply probably gave them some good ideas. But we do read about this start of human sexuality in these words from chapter 2 of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, uh, verses 18 to 25. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. And I will make for him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called the living cre every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs, and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And then he, the man said, This at last is bone of my bones 
and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and the woman were both naked and were not ashamed. One of the purposes of sex was listed in the in an earlier chapter, uh, chapter one of Genesis, in which is called what we call commonly the, the cultural mandate, which included, among other things, the filling of the earth with one's progeny. So in Genesis chapter one, verse 28, it says, and God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the ground. But besides the mandate to procreate, there was also the whole relationship in the sexual experience that was intended. And we get a glimpse of it right after the fall in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, he was talking to the woman and he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. Your, in pain you shall bring your fourth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. That the whole human ex sexual experience uh, included sensuality and desire and passion and just being plain horny and randy at times is quite evident in the uh, Old Testament and particularly in a book called Solomon's Song or also called the Song of Songs. Now here's a book that talks about a boy and a girl liking each other to the point of distraction and they get engaged to be married and they become hot for each other. Then the marriage occurs well and there's some real fireworks going on here. Wow. Here's a little sample from chapter 1 verses 13 to chapter 2 verse 7. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyard of Engede. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. Behold, you are beautiful, my beloved. Truly delightful. Our couch is green. The beams of our house are cedar. Our rafters are pine. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. As a lily among brambles, so is my love among the young women. As an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. With great delight, I sat at his, in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with raisins. Refresh me with apples, for I am sick with love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Then in Psalm uh, chapter 7, verses 1 to 13, it has these words. How beautiful are your feet in sandals, O noble daughter! Your rounded thighs are like jewels the work of a master hand. Your navel is a rounded bowl that never lacks mixed wine. Your belly is a heap of wheat encircled with lilies. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are pools in Heshbon by the gate of Bath Rabim. Your nose is like a tower of Lebanon, which looks towards Damascus. Your head crowns you like caramel, and your flowing locks are like purple. A king is held captive in the tresses. How beautiful and pleasant you are, O loved one, 
with all your delights. Your stature is like a palm tree and your breasts are like clusters. I say I will climb the palm tree and lay hold of its fruit. Oh, may your breasts be like clusters of the vine and the scent of your breath like apples and your mouth like the best wine. It goes down smoothly for my beloved, gliding my over lips and teeth. I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. Come, my beloved. Let us go out into the fields and lodge in the villages. Let us go out early to the vineyards and see whether the vines are budded, whether the great blossoms are opened and the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. The mandrakes give forth fragrance, and beside our doors are all choice fruits, new as well as old, which I have laid up for you, O my beloved. Some pretty rousing stuff. It's clear from this and other passages that there is a deep and abiding relationship between a man and a woman here. And it is how God intended the wondrous gift of sex. It was never intended to be any other way. In fact, so much so that God actually has put limitations on sexual practice special limitations and constrictions on what is allowed and what is not allowed regarding sexual practice. And so there's a very a long passage of 30-odd verses in the chapter 18 of Le, the book of Leviticus. And here you have Moses pointing out God's directions on how sexual activity is to be understood or what is not allowed. Hear these words from chapter 18, verse 1 to, 1 to 30. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where you lived. And you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, into which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them them. I am the Lord your God. You shall not, you shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does, uh, does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. None of you shall approach any one of his close relatives to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father, which is the nakedness of your mother. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is your father's nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your sister, your father's daughter, or your mother's daughter, whether brought up in the family or in another home. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your son's daughter or of your daughter's daughter, for their nakedness is their own nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's of your wife your father's wife's daughter, brought up in your father's family, since she is your sister. And you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's sister, she is your father's relative. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister, she is your mother's relative. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's brother, that is, you shall not approach his wife. She is your aunt. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your daughter-in-law. She is your son's wife. So shall you not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and of her daughter. And you should not take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness. They are relatives. It is depravity. And you shall not take a woman as a rival wife to her sister, uncovering her nakedness while her sister is still alive. And you shall not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness while she is in her menstrual uncleanness. And you shall not lie sexually with your neighbor's wife and so make yourself unclean to her, with her. 
You shall not give any of your children to offer them to Molech and so profane the name of, the, of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. And you shall not lie with any animal and so make yourself unclean with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to an animal to lie with it. It is a perversion. Do not make yourself unclean by any of these things. For by all these the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean. And the land became unclean, so that I punished its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you shall keep my statutes and my rules, and do none of these abominations, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For the people of the land who were before you did all these abominations, so that the land became unclean. Lest the land vomit you out when you make it unclean, as it vomited out the nation that was before you. For everyone who does any of these abominations, the persons who do them shall be cut off from among their people. So keep my charge never to practice any of these abominable customs that were practiced before you, and never to make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. And of course, that is summed up in one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, you have this in Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. You shall not commit adultery. It just kind of covers all of that. One of the other strictures that was put on sexual relations was that it was to be done only with a spouse chosen from within the household of faith. In the Old Testament, that meant that you were to marry within the Israelite nation, whether within your race, within your religion. And this was commanded to avoid pagan influence in the culture, detracting from the pure and honest worship of the Lord. There were even penalties for marrying foreigners. And you know what? It continues right up into the New Testament. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 17, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk with them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you. Now when we talk about this idea of being unequally yoked, it helps if you have an agrarian background, if you were a farmer. In the old days, you had two pairs of oxen that were matched in size. If you had a bigger one than a, over a smaller one, and you matched them up into a, a bulwark, when it came time to pulling the plow ahead, the big one would push ahead, and the little one would lag behind because of its lack of strength, and it would create a pinching around the neck of the big one. Not the little one, but the big one. And so to avoid the pinch, that particular large bullock would begin to turn in a circle to avoid the strain on the neck, and it would end up just going in circles, which is why you always had a matched set. The same thing goes for God's people. God wants us to be equally yoked so that we're not pinching one another's neck and going in circles into sin. But sex in, the proper, in a proper marriage is meant to be a wondrous thing. In fact, what goes on behind closed doors is something that is only grounded in the love and the respect between two consenting marital partners. 
It says in, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 14, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled. Which brings us then, if God has strictures and commands about what you can and cannot do, what are the consequences of wrongful, sinful activity? Well, most people don't realize this, but Noah's flood was a direct result of sexual promiscuity. Here's the reason behind it from Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and the daughters were born to them, the sons of men saw that the daughters of men were attractive. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive. And they took as their wives any that they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and afterwards, when the sons of God came to the daughters of man, and they bore children to them, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of men was great on the earth, and that every intention of their thoughts, the thoughts of his heart, was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and he grieved him in his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the earth, from the face of the land. Man and animals and creeping things, birds and heavens of the heavens, I, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And we all know what happened after that. But it's not the only place you'll find such things. Sodom and Gomorrah were also the recipients of God's wrath at the blatant sexual sin, sexual, homosexual misconduct. So we read in Genesis chapter 13, verse 13, Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. In chapter 19, beginning with verses 4 to 13 and then 23 to 28, we have these words. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. They called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. And Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do not do do not do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, Stand back. And they said, This fellow came to sojourn, and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man lot, and drew near to break the door down. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out by groping for the door. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city? Bring them out of this place, for we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. The sun has risen, had, had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife looked behind him, looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord, and he looked down on Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he looked, and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. Terrible story. 
and judgment from God. But I want you to note that the Lord also took action against adultery and rape as well. In Judges chapters 19 and 20 is the story about how all of Israel went to war against the tribe of Benjamin because they did not give up the rapists of a concubine. They were all destroyed. And it's really gruesome stuff. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, we have King David's adulterous indiscretion with Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, whom David subsequently murders. And in spite of David's confession of sin and remorse, the child that was born and conceived dies. And David's sword, from that time on, was always by his sword, uh, by his side, rather. His days were none, not ones of peace. He was always defending against all comers, including even from his own house, his own son, Absalom. Later, in chapter 13 of 2 Samuel, one of David's kin, Amnon, rapes his half-sister, Tamar, who is a sister to Absalom. And her brother Absalom plans and affects deadly revenge. You see, there's lots of ways sexuality can go wrong. Temptations and the lusts of men go on. But illicit sex can have its own intrinsic damage in and of itself, as we can see from a passage that's written in Proverbs. Chapter 6, verses 20 to 35. My son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always and tie them around your neck. When you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. And when you wake up, they will talk with you. For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light and the reproofs of dis discipline are a way of life. To preserve you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Do not desire her beauty in your heart, and do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. For the price of a prostitute is only a loaf of bread, but a married woman hunts down a precious life. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Or can, can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So it is he, so is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. None who touches her will go unpunished. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his appetite when he's hungry. But if he is caught, he will pay sevenfold. And he will give all the goods of his house. He who commits adultery lacks sense. And his disgrace will not be wiped away. For jealousy makes a man furious. And he will not spare. And he will not spare when he takes revenge. He will accept no compensation. He will refuse though he, you multiply gifts. In other words, you dishonor somebody and their household, the price is very high. Worse is the fact that because sinful people act as they do, the Bible tells us that sinful people suppress the truth of God in their lives. In fact, so much so that God gives them over to their sin. It first takes effect in our thinking and then it affects your feelings, which finally then affect your actions. It starts with this never-ending spiral down into death and destruction. We, we note this in first, uh, the first chapter of Romans, verses 18 to 32. For the wrath of God 
is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were, they are, are, are full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and, mal and maliceness, maliciousness. And they are gossips and slanderers and haters of God, insolent and haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, and foolish, fruitless. Are faithless, heartless, ruthless. And though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. And you can see from Scripture here that it's quite clear that those who practice sexual sin and who remain unrepented will not enter the kingdom of God and are going to suffer his terrible wrath and judgment. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteousness, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. We also read in Galatians chapter 5, similarly in verses 19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In fact, it says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. It gets worse. Jesus ups the ante and forces us to acknowledge the whole mental processes of humans when he declares that our thoughts are just as important as our actions. And so in the Sermon on the Mount, Chapter 5 of Matthew, verses 27 to 30 says, You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with a lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. 
If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than to have your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into and have your whole body go into hell. Sex is great, but you need to stay within the confines of what is allowed and what's not. We live in a world that is enticed and people get excited. How do you safely control the urge to merge? Well, the best way to control yourself, according to Paul, is to make use of the creational safety valve of marriage. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 and 9, to the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single, as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. But, you know, even in a happy marriage, one must learn to avoid temptation. So here's some really good advice. First says. Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 to 7. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion uh, of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress or wrong his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is an avenger of these things. As we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 says, Flee from sexual immorality. Every sin a person commits outside is outside of the body. But sexually immoral person, the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. That's how bad it is. And you know what? If you ever get into trouble, if you are about to succumb to temptations because you are weak, do what one of my favorite Old Testament guys does. Run. Genesis chapter 39, verses 6 to 12 says, Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. And he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is, he is not greater in this house than I am. And nor has he kept anything back from me because of you, except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or be with her. But one day, when he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was in the house, she caught him by his garment and said, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And that's what you should do. Yeah. He paid a price for that. He went to jail for a long time. But God had other plans for Joseph and made him the second most powerful person in Egypt as a result. Look, I have not uh, dealt with every single inference and uh, instance of sex in the Bible. There's just too much to note here in this video. Uh, but I think I have given you, a, hopefully, a grasp of this very broad topic, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Remember that sex is a gift from God, and it should be enjoyed by all in its right context at the right times. Some of you may be very uncomfortable right now. It probably goes to our purpose here to inform you what is exactly illicit sex in this day and age. 
there are the obvious things like sexual intercourse and fornication outside of marriage. And you can add any and all male and female homosexual activity to that. Also included is anything that smacks of sexual predation, like rape and torture and pedophilia. But what about two people who are falling in love but are not yet married? What about them? Well, the key here is focusing on the intent of the relationship between each other and God, who has said to remain pure. In mutual love, if mutual love and trust are indeed present, causing you to further lust and burn with passion to the point where you proceed with an act of sexual intercourse and or other sexual familiar, you got to stop. You have to refrain from such activity for the love of the person involved as well as for the love of God. It is not worth the emotional, physical, and relational damage that can and does occur. If you can't control it, get married. Well, what about a relationship between two people who are married to other spouses or to one is and one isn't, but who find themselves falling in love with someone else. Well, if there becomes a significant other in your life, other than the one that you are married to, then you are not only playing with the fire and passions of human sexuality, but more importantly, you have already broken the marriage covenant of faith with your married partner. Sex, you see, is something that's just physical. It's emotional and relational as well. And as such, building an intimate relationship with someone other than your spouse, even if there's no physical sex involved, actually constitutes a breach of the marriage covenant. You see, such intimacy is reserved in marriage exclusively for your partner. In short, if you are involved in any of the following, then you are in the wrong before God. Having sexual intercourse with anyone outside of marriage, anytime, regardless of your feelings for them. Oral sex with anyone outside of marriage, anytime, regardless of your feelings for them. And this includes group sex of any kind, inside or outside of marriage. Any physical contact or stimulation engaged in that pushes the envelope and causes you to want to do it or uh, receive satisfaction in another way outside of marriage, like perhaps groping or petting or watching or reading pornography. Any and all homosexual activity, male or female, inside or outside of marriage. Any form of rape, incest, pedophilia, inside or outside of marriage. Prostitution or cultic ritual inside or outside of marriage. Displacing the intimacy of a marital covenant with a relationship with another that has emotional, relational characteristics with or without physical sexual intimacy. Thinking about any of the above to the point where it becomes an obsession or a distraction is sinful in the eyes of God. I think maybe some of you might be a bit distressed by now. You might say, okay, I've committed sexual sin. What now? Well, recognizing that fact and fearing God in this matter is probably the first step. And you need to be afraid here because God's not kidding around. The consequences of sexual sin in this life and the life to come are horrendous. The next step is to recognize the Lordship of Jesus Christ, who is your creator, and acknowledge him as the only one who can save anyone who has committed any kind of sin. So admit your guilt and ask God to forgive you. Jesus can and will forgive you of your sins, any and all of them. If you are willing to accept him as your Savior, 
ask him to take over your life in such a way as you are now willing to live the kind of life that God has intended for you. The caveat to this is the third step. If you are doing these things or have done them in the past, you must stop. Stop sinning sexually. No matter what the costs are in terms of relationships or finances or other determinations, you must stop. From this point on, to be pure before God. If it is too late and sexual activity has already occurred for all the wrong reasons, you can start over. And even if you were wrong and have blown it, you can receive forgiveness from God, and, and, you, and you can start over. The results of your past, however, may remain with you. But you can be renewed by God. God is in the, begin, in the business of rebuilding shattered lives of people who are penitent to him. If you would like to talk to someone, if you have questions or you're wanting some help, I want you to feel free to message me personally, and I will respond as soon as I can. I'm Scott Krieger, and this is my moment in the sun.